Well, hello everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all from me, Chris Barber, and a very warm welcome to the Musical Museum. It's lovely to have you with us once again for our second streamed event. Before we get any further into today's programme, can I just take the opportunity to say a very big thank you to all of you who tuned into our first programme a few weeks ago, and for the lovely feedback that you very kindly gave us about how much you'd enjoyed the music and how great the sound and the vision was. Um, it's really much, much appreciated, and we're very grateful for that, and we hope you'll be able to tune in for the yet more programmes. Now, as a result of that feedback, that's given rise to today's programme, because a lot of you said how wonderful the Wurlitzer is, but would love to know more about it. How does it make sounds? What are all the, why does it have three keyboards? And all sorts of interesting questions. And so in this programme, we're going to have a look at the, the Wurlitzer in a little bit more detail, in an hour, we can only give you just a, a flavour of the organ, but at least I hope it will give you some indication of how it works, what it does, its history, and hopefully it will entice you to come along to the museum when we reopen and see it and hear it for, for or, uh, real, but also to join in our other streamed events which are coming up throughout the rest of the year and into next year. Now, we're starting off with the world, itself because it is the largest exhibit in our collection, but we have a whole variety of other instruments which are fascinating, and we will be fe featuring those in forthcoming events. So I hope you're going to tune in to those. But for today, we're going to focus on this wonderful, wonderful Wurlitzer cinema organ. Well, you noticed today that I'm a little more casually dressed than I was when I played for you a couple of weeks ago, and that's because today's session is focusing very much on the Wurlitzer. And a couple of questions that were asked by people who tuned in were, what is a Wurlitzer and what is a theatre organ? Well, a lot of you who, joined, uh, who tuned in will obviously know the answer to that, but for those who perhaps don't, a cinema organ or a theatre organ, cinema organ if you're in England, theatre organ in America, but it essentially means exactly the same thing. These were instruments that were designed to accompany silent films. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that later in the, in the programme. Wurlitzer is the brand name. So these instruments were built by the Wurlitzer Corporation in a place called North Tonawanda in upstate New York in America. And again, a little more about that later on. Well, another question that came up uh, as a result of the feedback that you raised with us was, how old is the organ? Well, this Wurlitz was built in 1929. So you would have gathered that it celebrated its 90th birthday very recently. And the organ was originally built to go into the home of a Chicago millionaire, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Comstock. And he was going to have this organ in his home. However, when you look at the Wurlitzer records, they do show that the Wurlitzer never left the, uh, the Wurlitzer factory to go to Chicago. And the thinking behind it is that when the organ was built and ready to be paid for, Mr. Comstock had lost his fortune as a result of the Wall Street crash. And so the organ languished in the Wurlitzer factory for a few years until Regal Cinemas in the United Kingdom wanted an organ in a bit of a hurry for their new theatre at Kingston-upon-Thames in London. And so the organ was shipped over in the winter of 1931-32 and installed at the Regal at Kingston-upon-Thames and opened in early 1932 by a very famous organist at the time, a guy called Reginald Fort. And Reg played this organ for the first few months of its life, and then he was... Uh, succeeded by a whole variety of very famous organists, top names of the day, including Sidney Torch, Harold Ramsey, H. Robinson Cleaver, and perhaps the organist who is most associated with this organ was the amazing, wonderful Joseph Seal. And Joe Seal first started playing this organ in 1952 and remained as the resident organist and director of music for ABC Cinemas up until 1972 when this organ came out of the Regal Theatre and into the possession of the Musical Museum. Well, another question that we were asked is, is it an electronic organ, and where are the speakers? Well, it, it isn't an electronic organ, it is a pipe organ. Um, it's a, what we call a three-manual, 12-rank pipe organ, which basically means it has three manuals, or three keyboards, and 12 ranks, or sets of pipes, each set of pipes having its own distinct tone color. Now, here you say, where are the pipes? Well, the pipes for this organ are away in two chambers over the proscenium arch. So on a theatre organ or a cinema organ, all the pipe work is enclosed in one, two, sometimes as many as four chambers, whereas in a classical organ, 
or a church organ, most of the pipe work is available to be seen, and it's only usually one division, which is called a swell organ, is available, that you, is actually um, enclosed. So we say, very much a pipe organ, and the sound is produced by air passing through a pipe, and that air, air is provided by a, a blower motor, which sits away over in, behind me in the corner of the stage there, and that drives the air through the organ to allow it to speak through a pipe and make the sound. And it's pretty much as simple as that, really. This controls what notes I want. So this is very much, if you like, the flight deck. No sound comes from this at all, so there are no speakers. Literally, all the sound comes from the pipes, which are in the chambers above the proscenium arch. Well, as I say, here we are at the console. And this is where the organist sits to play and sits and controls the organ and is able to bring into play all the various ranks that are on the organ and mix and match them to produce that wonderful, glorious, warm sound that is so typical of the theatre pipe organ. Now, to make that happen, we need to visit the next part of the organ, which is the relay room. And in many ways, that's the brain of the organ. It's where the really clever stuff happens that turns the electrical signals that I send from here, from the console, into musical notes that come out in the pipes upstairs in the pipe chambers. And when you look inside the relay room, for those of you of a certain age, might look at it and say, wow, that looks like an old-fashioned telephone exchange. And that's because, in many ways, it is. Robert Hope Jones, the inventor, if you like, of the theatre organ, was by profession a telephone engineer and used the technology that he knew and understood to be able to separate out the console from the pipework, which prior to him had been physically linked by rods and levers. So Hope Jones' brilliance was to be able to use technology and electricity to separate them out, and the console is linked to the uh, relay room by something we call an umbilical cord, if you like, which takes all the electrical wires from the console to the relay room. Well, the final part of the jigsaw, if you like, of the organ are the two pipe chambers. And they are located away, up over the proscenium arch. There are two chambers up there full of just under a thousand pipes. And that's where the beautiful voice of this organ comes from. The pipes themselves range in length from about 16 feet, is the longest pipe, to just a few inches being the shortest pipe. And they're made out of wood and various metals. And together, they produce that wonderful, wonderful sound that we've heard thus far. There is one other little piece of uh, very clever equipment that's in there to make that sound even more glorious, which is the use of something called swell shades. So in the wall of the chambers, and this is the wall that speaks out into the auditorium, look like, or what appear to look like, Venetian blinds. And what they do is the more they open, the more sound comes out. As you close them, sound is restricted, and so the organ it quietens down. And you use this, and the organist uses this, should I say, as a means of being able to add additional expression as opposed to just using the stop keys. Turning back to the console again, Somebody once said to me when they were here on a visit that this row of what they described as tabs rather looked like the players in an orchestra sitting around the conductor. And in many ways, that's a very good description of what these things are. And in fact, what they are are the stops on the organ. Now, if, again, if you're used to going into church, you'll have seen the organist pulling out stops. They're called draw stops, hence the expression, pull out all the stops to get things done. Well, on a theatre organ, the stops are laid out in this fashion, which we call tab stops, and they control the various ranks on the organ. And someone said, why are they all different colours? And the reason for that is that the different colours denote a different type of pipe. Now, for example, if we take a, one with a tab stop like this, which is co coloured white, that means it controls a rank which is known as a flu rank. And what that means is that air passes over the lip at the base of the pipe 
and produces a sound in pretty much the same way as a flautist when they put the, pipe, the, the flute to the lips and blow air over the, the lip of the, the flute, they get that sound. It's the same kind of principle. That's what we call a flute rank. The red colored tabs indicate a reed rank, and that means this is a pipe that produces its note by air making a reed vibrate in the base of the pipe. Pretty much, again, the same as an oboe or a clarinet. It's that same kind of idea. Ah, but I hear you say, what about the yellow and the black? Well, on a Wurlitzer, where you have a yellow tab, this indicates what's called a celeste rank. And what that means is that it sits next to another rank of the same uh, tone family, but is tuned slightly sharp to give it a breadth and a width and a, a degree of warmth. Let me show you what I mean. So here is, just to start off with, the violin. I'm now going to put the violin celeste with it. And straight away you can hear the tone is wider, it has a beat, and it has a warmer quality to it. So yellow tabs denote a celeste rank. Black tabs are what are called couplers. And what they do is either couple manuals together or manuals to pedals down here, or notes on each individual manual. And I'm going to show you how that works now. If I play a note like this, I can then add in what's called a super octave coupler or an octave coupler, which gives me a second note sounding an octave higher. And then I can also add in a sub octave coupler which gives me another now sounding an octave lower. So by using the two couplers, I can actually play one note, but have three notes sounding. The other coupler we have is what's called a solo to great coupler. And what that does is bring this manual to this one and couples it together. So here's the sound up here. And I put it in, the coupler in, and there it is down on this middle manual. And essentially, that's what the couplers do. Now, those of you who've got very good eyesight will have noticed that on the tab stops, there are numbers. And those numbers denote pitch. Now, if we take a tab stop that's got the number eight on it, that means that that pipe speaks at unison pitch or to put it very simply, the same pitch as the piano. So if I play a stop here at middle C, that sounds exactly the same as middle C on the piano, which I can demonstrate like this. Preferably if I hit the right note as well, it works. So that's what we call unison pitch. So a stop that has an eight on it means it speaks in the same pitch as, if you like, as the piano, at unison pitch. Where you see the number 16, that indicates a pipe that will speak an octave lower, and a pipe, therefore, where you would see the number 4 speaks an octave higher. Two foot, or a pipe with a number 2 on it, two octaves higher. So by using a combination of the various pitches together, you can produce a big sound with a very small number of notes produced, like this. So here's the eight foot pitch. And I can now add 16, four, and two. So for one note being held, I've got one, two, three, four notes sounding. And for those of you who remember what I just said about the couplers, we can put the sub and the octave coupler in 
and that will give us six notes sounding for the holding just one note down on the keyboard. Now, the other thing just to draw your attention to are the combination pistons that sit under each manual. As you can see, is one to eight on these two manuals and one to five on the top one. And what these do is allow the organist to pre-store a combination of sounds that he or she wishes to use for either a particular piece or in a concert or for a performance. And the mechanism for doing that is by using something called a setter board, which sits behind the console. Now, the setter board is an original 1929 um, piece of equipment. And because the muse this, this is a museum uh, artifact, we have to retain that original mechanism. So when we want to set combinations for different organists, or when I want to set them for when I'm playing, we have to go behind the console and move little pins onto little strips of metal to make contact, which allow us then to store combinations. And if I just press a couple of buttons, you will see how that works. So for example, I can press this number one here, and it's a very quiet, lush sound. But if I then wanted to go to a very big sound quickly, I can press that. You get a much bigger sound. And it would be very hard to do that quickly and easily if you were having to register by hand. So what we've seen now is the three manuals, we talked a little bit about the pedals down here. We talked about the tabs and the fact that they control different ranks. And now it's a question really of pulling it all together to show you how it works. And unusual features of the theatre organ is something called the second touch, or sometimes called the double touch. And it is unique to the theatre organ. And what it allows you to do is basically have two sounds available on a manual, one at a first touch and a second by pressing a little harder. Let me try and illustrate that for you. So here is a very gentle sound that's available at first touch. Here it is, the flute, first touch. Just to make the point really clear, I'm going to put a very loud stop on, on the second touch, and then you'll hear it come through very clearly. So here's the flute at the first touch, and then by pressing a little harder, you can hear the, the second louder stop come through on the second touch. Now you can use this facility in a whole variety of different ways. But I'm just going to show you just one. What I'm going to do in this example is just play a very simple little tune for you called Bye Bye Blues. And I'm going to set up the same combination on this manual as is available on the second touch. And as I play, I'll drop the right hand out. So it works a little like this. So here's Bye Bye Blues. Just very simple little arrangement. Melody's in the right hand. This time, I'm going to play it, but drop the right hand out, and you'll see the right hand come away. Here we go.
So there you see the melody pick and the accompaniment played in one hand. What that allows us to do then is put a decorative figure over the top. And let's maybe have some muted trumpet stabs coming over the top of that little melody in the uh, left hand. So here comes the melody, and watch out for the trumpet stabs. And that's just one way of being able to use the second touch, but it adds a whole another layer of musicality to your playing and performance. And of course, many organists have used it in different ways over the years, but probably one of the masters of the use of second touch was of course the great Reginald Dixon. And Reg was an absolute king at using it. And that was a fundamental feature of what he developed is we now know as the Blackpool style. Now we've talked about uh, playing orchestrally and I've explained how the different manuals work together to give us an orchestral sort of effect and sound. But of course you can't have an orchestra without a, a percussion section and not surprisingly the world has its own percussion section and the percussions on this organ are both tuned and non-tuned. Let's look at the tuned percussions first. So, we have, for example, a very bright xylophone. We have a glockenspiel. And we have a lovely vibraphone. And if you want to kind of maybe think about being in church, a set of tower chimes. We also have, as I say, some non-tuned percussions. So, for example, down here on the pedal, we have a bass drum. And we also have here on the accompaniment a snare drum. So we can do this kind of thing. So if you fancy a bit of military music, there it is. On the other hand, if you fancy some Latin American music, we have a tambourine, a set of castanets, if you fancy a bit of Spanish music, and a little Chinese block, which is great. Now, the other thing we have, which is not strictly a percussion instrument, but is a great addition to this organ, is the ability to play from the console the grand piano which is on the left hand side of the stage and we can do that just like this. And when people have come to the museum who've never been here before and see that for the very first time, they're often quite blown away. Um, the first time my daughter came and saw it, it frightened her. Uh, she thought it was very spooky that the piano would somehow play on its own. There is one last area of the organ that we just need to look at to really bring us almost back to where we started. Now, as I said, this organ was built in 1929 and that the organ organs like this were designed to accompany silent films. Now although this organ was never ever used for silent film accompaniment, it still nevertheless has some of the features to enable it to do that. And this is what we call the toy counter or traps. So for example, if there had been say a street scene and you've got the horse galloping along the road, there he is whizzing along. You may have had a scene by the sea, and here's the surf. The 
See, all you need then, really, is that, I guess, is this. Little birds singing in the garden. And, of course, you couldn't have gone in those far-off days without seeing a Keystone Cops film where you've got the bad guys rushing away, being chased by the good guys, the Keystone Cops. And there's the gong on the front of the car. And you may have had the organist play in this kind of thing. The little siren. And then... My personal favourite, mainly because it's rude, the auto horn. So we still use those, and we still have a lot of fun using those effects in today, even though, as I say, this organ was never, ever used for a silent film accompaniment. However, here in the museum, we do use the organ for silent films. We show silent films three or four times a year, and the organ is used in that original context, and we do use those traps. Now, when people hear the theatre organ, it's a very distinctive and a very evocative sound, often associated with times gone by. And the sound that they kind of hear is this very warm, lush, round sound. And part of that is due to the use of something called a tremolant. Now, classical organs do have tremolants, but only, on the whole, very gentle, very light ones. And they're only available at certain, in certain divisions on an organ. With a theatre organ, you have the presence of a very heavy tremolant to give you that shimmering sound that you create with an orchestra. And it sounds a little bit like this. If I take what's called the tibia rank on the organ, this is the fundamental sound on a theatre organ. It's, if you like, the glue that holds everything else together. And it sounds a little like this. Which sounds a little bit like Choral Evensong from the Musical Museum. Until we introduce the presence of the tremolant, and then it sounds like this. This organ has, in fact, actually five tremolants on it, which affect the whole of the organ if you use all five at once, or you can use them selectively to create different effects. But often, the sound that a lot of people associate with the theatre organ, and in the tremolant in particular, is when you use what's called a, a, a tibia and vox humana combination, which is this sort of sound, which is very typical of the theatre organ, and relies very heavily on the presence of a tremolant. So it's kind of this. And that whole sound is carried by the vox, the tibia, and the two trems that are working very beautifully there to give us that wonderful, lush, round sound. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that really is all we have time for today. I hope you've enjoyed seeing something of the world it's at behind the scenes, as it were, and getting a bit of an understanding about some of the technicalities of the organ. And if you have enjoyed that, please do join us for some future uh, videos we'll be uh, doing, which will feature some of the other instruments in the collection here at the museum. So please keep an eye out on the website for those. Also, of course, please do join us on the 23rd of August at 3 p.m. British Summertime when we will have Richard Hills doing a live streamed concert. So that's definitely not one to be missed. So it only remains for me to say bye to all of you wherever you are in the world. I hope you've enjoyed it. And on behalf of all of us here at the Musical Museum, stay safe, stay well, and we look forward to seeing you soon. But in the meantime, this is Chris Barber saying bye for now.